Um, well, this subject came to my mind when um, in the summer um, I was struggling with a um, newborn that I watched uh, over time. I saw the mom in fetal, uh, fetal consultation and there was significant hydrocephalus. Um, looked like pot potential aqueductal stenosis and the hydrocephalus progressed and then once that uh, baby was born the hydrocephalus was so significant that it had caused like a secondary like um, uh, uh, Chiari anomaly, there might have been like a pre-existing Chiari that was just like aggravated, the kid needed to be intubated at day one and still challenged by the respiratory complications. And um, at the same time, we had done our fetal intervention for spina bifida and that went well. And so the neonatologists were challenging me and were saying, um, why Dr. Klinge, why, why don't we revisit the fetal intervention for hydrocephalus because we might have helped that uh, other baby. And it's interesting that the fetal intervention for spina bifida is so well established uh, these days and uh, offered as a, you know, as a, sec as a valid option um, uh, these days by many pediatric uh, centers, but um, uh, the intervention for hydrocephalus uh, is halted after a moratorium that was um, released by the um, uh, Society of Fetal Medicine in 1986. Um, so I want to re revisit it um, uh, because the neonatologists kind of they challenged me with that. So. Um, I picked that topic, uh, fatal fetal hydrocephalus, because uh, uh, the, the literature uh, from the uh, 70s and 80s, when more prenatal imaging uh, was available, not necessarily M MRI, but also ultrasound, was able to get a little bit more on the natural history on uh, congenital hydrocephalus. And uh, um, the group around um, Neil Sutton uh, published like a nice review uh, in 2003, um, looking back what um, how the natural history of hydrocephalus had occurred and uh, how that then had implied like possible fetal intervention for hydrocephalus. So the studies show that um, uh, basically what they show, if you look at the table, is mainly that, um, so these were patients that were, or fetuses that were diagnosed with um, uh, hydrocephalus based on ultrasound. They lumped together all sorts of uh, etiologies like aqueductal stenosis, Chiari II malformations, Dandy Walker, and uh, also hydrocephalus associated with other comorbidities. But anyways, the, uh, a high percentage of, of, of uh, non-survivors in that group, as you can see here in the uh, uh, second um, row, like up to 61% uh, of babies that died in utero. Uh, of course, of those that survived, um, the developmental delay was not so bad according to uh, other studies, but still moderate to severe disability uh, if it comes to the cognitive uh, or other development um, in these uh, uh, patients. So that certainly, you know, encouraged in the event of prenatal imaging to think, uh, to make people think of uh, repair. And then certainly, as with anything, um, lamp and uh, monkey experiments were done in the late 70s. Um, as you know, the MOMS trial or, or the rationale for fetal intervention in spina bifida also came from sheep uh, uh, experiments where they had shown that the neural tube um, is uh, degrading uh, in, with the amniotic um, irritation. But anyways, those had shown that there's improved survival uh, in the treated fetuses. And uh, when they extrapolated the gestational age of the monkeys and lambs to the human gestational age, not quite sure how you can reliably do that, uh, but um, uh, they said that probably intervention before 30 weeks of gestational age is beneficial. And then, not a surprise, in the early 80s, uh, a group uh, around Bernholz and Frigoletti, they uh, performed like serial ventriculosynthesis as long as possible because then once the skull became more calcified, there was certainly like a limitation to that. So they basically, under ultrasonic guidance, punctured the ventricles and drained them out. Um, uh, and, uh, and then the first treatment with shunt historically was done in the University of Colorado in the early 80s by uh, William Clavel. Um, and um, they were sort of, this was sort of like then encouraging further intervention. Um, 
Manning, uh, the one uh, was uh, from University of Manitoba, was the one that then created a um, uh, interna international fetal surgery registry. F Eleven U.S. centers participated, and um, uh, of course, this is just like a little blurb of, of what they required from the center. Um, not a, of course, a high-risk obstetric unit and um, uh, anesthesia, comfortable with fetal intervention. Um, then who was eligible for the intervention were just patients with isolated hydrocephalus, not other anomalies and um, uh, the um, otherwise uh, also uh, healthy uh, children. Uh, so they conducted the study and um, uh, this is just um, a summary of um, the results. Um, as I said, uh, the kids uh, were uh, treated. Um, what they implanted was more like a ventricular amniotic shunt, as you can see here in the, um, you see the, oh, yeah. oh, that's good. So um, uh, under um, ultrasonic uh, guidance, um, a tubing was uh, introduced into the ventricles uh, and then um, re connected to the amniotic fluid. Um, and uh, it, there was like a little coil that should have, you know, that was designed to hold that in place. And uh, the fetuses were treated at the 25 to 27th, um, uh, the 27th week of gestation and um, uh, uh, were then, uh, uh, and the results were analyzed. Um, so um, uh, the, uh, of this, the patients that had survived this treatment, I come later to the uh, problem of uh, fetus, fetal death from that intervention, um, still 53% um, had severe handicap. Uh, they had severe handicap. They signed a developmental quotient, uh, and it turned out that they were below 50%, which is obviously pretty bad. And 12% um, uh, had less serious handicap, and 35% 35 35 were quote unquote normal uh, without a major handicap. Um, and that was at, at a follow up at eight months, uh, uh, maximum 18 months in this cohort. And um, certainly, um, uh, then um, uh, for the further intervention and uh, more interventions had shown uh, that um, uh, that there is a high related procedure uh, uh, death. Uh, you can see here, um, Clavel went on and uh, created also like. A more sophisticated shunt, like a ventricular amniotic celastic shunt with a one-way valve even, so valve were even implemented in the treatment of fetal hydrocephalus. And um, uh, he designed like a percutaneous placement under ultrasonic guidance, so minimally invasive. So all these technical um, issues were um, addressed, but uh, there was a high rate of dislodged and migrated catheters, blockage, that's not a surprise. And uh, chemical meningitis, because besides, uh, or despite, sorry, despite the valve treatment, there was, you know, amniotic fluid oozing into the ventricles because the tissue is just so fragile and uh, probably like a ventricular, uh, an amniotic ventricular fistulas were created that, um, ca that uh, uh, caused um, chemical meningitis. And then 10% um, procedure-related deaths due to also brainstem injury or premature delivery. So um, very concerning results. And that's why then um, in the late 80s, only after a decade of performing these uh, procedures, or you could say after a decade, shouldn't be saying only, the, um, that was then the end of prenatal repair of hydrocephalus. So um, this was in the newspapers. They said that uh, we really don't change the natural history of uh, fetal uh, intervention. We still have, of those survivors, despite the high rate of death, 53 percent uh, uh, kids that are born with serious handicap. And if you compare that to the historical natural course, uh, to the data of the natural course, the historical data from the early 70s, uh, there is not much betterness. In, how uh, the fetus or how the child ends up after fetal intervention. So not a good trade-off, and so it was stopped. Um, here, just the summary of the recommendation of the fetal medicine and surgery society in 1968, uh, 86, 
um, uh, that just summarizes um, what I mentioned. Um, again, they appreciate certainly that there, that there was not really like in all those studies and even the, and the study that Manning designed, the Mulzer Center trial, they were not having like a true control cohort. Uh, only, we only have the historical results um, that were, um, pub, you know, that, that we know from the early 70s and 80s. Um, so th it's difficult to really, um, it's, it's not a very robust uh, um, study because, again, they were not only historical controls and not a uh, true uh, control cohort along with those fetal interventions that were done. Um, so um, what they said, you know, from, from their study is that certainly fetal intervention might improve um, uh, the, the survival, but um, not really uh, the outcome, and um, uh, again, there is not a good uh, trade-off. Um, the words that were thrown to fetal intervention in hydrocephalus were experimental, unproven efficacy, and the, the evidence is only anecdotal, and uh, studies weren't designed in a, a good way. And other than, for example, the MAMS trial, that was a, a randomized trial, and so um, everything was stopped. Um, since 86, certainly, there were fetal interventions for hydrocephalus was done in, in, in certain centers. Um, uh, people were uh, encouraged to not put, you know, not follow that mora uh, moratorium that was applied. Uh, there, is, there are some lit literatures that I have uh, placed on that uh, uh, slide from 2008, 2003, where uh, with some, again, anecdotal successful treatment of fetuses, new valve uh, new shunts were designed that had a little bit more like improved anchoring uh, uh, opportunity and uh, less um, chances of migration. You can imagine that little coil that was almost set up for like going further in into the brain. So uh, some encouraging results. And um, then there was one review again, uh, thinking of what might be potentially the best group of patients that will be best eligible for fetal intervention. And um, there was a large British study um, that uh, uh, reported um, uh, that, um, hold on, I'm just kind of, uh, that probably those patients with isolated uh, aqueductal stenosis and progress, proven progressive ventriculomegaly in utero might be the population where we still are allowed or uh, to, uh, potentially look into fetal intervention and to potentially look at that cohort, whether they might benefit and uh, also with less risk from the intervention. So, um, uh, but still, uh, those data did not really show um, improved outcome either. Uh, and uh, still uh, fa facing the um, uh, high p uh, uh, fetal death from those interventions and premature delivery, as we have seen with the MUMPS trial, um, uh, the same uh, condition. Um, the one thing uh, was also um, uh, questioned is, what is a good timing in, in terms of was the, is the timing, uh, was it a matter of timing? That's why fetal intervention has not really improved outcome and not really improved the survival of the fetus. Um, and there was one, uh, um, when you look at experimental data, we know that um, uh, the formation of the layers of the brain and the septo, sept, synaptogenesis um, is most important in the second uh, trimester and not so much in the, in the uh, um, third trimester. And the third trimester is usually where the fetal interventions were done. So is it that the fetal intervention, which is most doable in the third trimester, is just missing the bus on where the cortex really is reliably forming? But you obviously cannot do a fetal intervention in the second trimester uh, because the fetus is just so fragile. So is it just that the whole concept doesn't apply uh, for, for hydrocephalus because we know the vulnerable period for the hydrocephalus to um, uh, damage the brain is the second trimester and not the third trimester, and that is certainly is a little bit, might be different in spina bifida. 
So, so the timing uh, was questioned, and uh, that's also uh, questioned the whole feasibility and viability of, of uh, prenatal repair. Um, the other thing is, okay, could it be that these days in age we should be revisiting us because we have better MRI techniques, we can do better genetic studies. For example, this is a patient of mine that, wasn't, uh, that had a huge, large arachnoid cyst. Uh, back in the days where we had ultrasound, we wouldn't even know that this is a huge, large arachnoid cyst. So now with better imaging techniques, can we better create better eligibility, eligibility or better uh, um, uh, stratification for uh, patients that might be eligible for fetal intervention. So certainly MRI um, uh, these days and age might maybe help us to guide us to identify a good candidate and also um, to better stratify different types of hydrocephalus, fetal hydrocephalus, and um, get better cohort studies um, if we are aiming to uh, pursue future studies in, in, uh, in, into a fetal intervention. So there's a lot of hopes in MRI, but if you talk to pediatric MRI uh, neurologists, and maybe Dr. Kobe was going to say something about it, they are not really excited about um, uh, the MRI being the biomarker here because there's still so much we have to understand uh, for in the developing brain uh, uh, if it comes to the fetus. And uh, I think I get that. That is still also not well studied. The main challenge, of course, is the technique, as with anything. Um, people now trend to even more minimally invasive. Could it be that the endoscope these days and age is helping us to apply um, uh, better treatment, safer treatment in fetal uh, intervention that is certainly not looked at? Um, uh, uh, but again, if we think of timing, when to intervene for hydrocephalus, we shouldn't be forgetting that the second trimester is a vulnerable period for the brain, and we might never be able to target that unless one, uh, you have other thoughts. And uh, I'm also giving that talk to get your thoughts on this um, uh, in, in terms of should we consider, again, looking into fetal intervention for hydrocephalus. Uh, the, um, uh, as I said, the data uh, or the perspective now is that probably those children with isolated aqueductal stenosis uh, no other comorbidities, uh, and progressive, demonstrated progressive ventricular megaly in utero might be can candidates that um, uh, are um, future candidates for fetal intervention, and um, um, that's probably maybe the ideal patients for in utero treatment, and that was um, also uh, suggested by Manning um, after he was contemplating about the failure of fetal surgery in the 80s. Of course, not a surprise that no one else, or no other than Tulipan, um, tried uh, did uh, um, some interventions in fetal hydrocephalus. Uh, he, as you know, was one of the pioneers of the, um, uh, the fetal intervention for spina bifida, and um, he, um, uh, what he used, uh, um, uh, he he did it actually through hysterotomy. So not uh, through ultrasound guidance uh, uh, or am amniocentesis. He did uh, performed a hysterotomy and um, shunted the ventricles into the subcutaneous tissue and to in between the scapula of the uh, fetus to kind of let it just drain subcutaneously. And then once the baby were, was born, uh, uh, turned it or um, turned it into a peritoneal shunt. Um, he treated, I think, one, two, three, four, f uh, five patients. Um, at, as you can see here, at week 23, 25, 26, 20, uh, and another one, 26. And um, uh, he uh, came to the conclusion that it's probably not safe to even do it that way with uh, serotomy, more controlled placement of the tubing as he did it because um, uh, one baby developed uh, sepsis, the other one developed preterm delivery due to chorion and, and amnionitis, and then one death occurred from sepsis, and um, the last case four was severely developmentally delayed. So his conclusion in a publication in 2006 was um, uh, ventricular amniotic shunt can be placed through a hysterotomy, uh, overcoming many of the technical difficulties of the earlier percutaneous shunts. However, recent developments in fetal imaging and molecular genetics have not improved case selection. 
so unless new breakthroughs occur, uh, fetal shunting can, cannot reasonably be expected to improve uh, outcome at this point. So um, again, should we be doing a randomized trial, like moms had done it, with very clear eligibility criteria, um, and then only looking at uh, fetuses with isolated aqueductal stenosis um, and uh, evidence of hydrocephalus progression in utero, doing good genetic studies, and, um, uh, and then um, certainly understand um, uh, the CSF dynamics in the fetus much better, I put. Hilary Kate's society logo here because that's what he's promoting, that neuroradiologists should stand up and help us with better imaging of the CSF uh, compartment.